Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where it turns out that Barbenheimer is not a one-weekend fluke, but is a genuine box office phenomenon. I'm happy for both movies, but I'm relieved about Barbie. A lot of the hate came out very strong at the last minute because the movie only showed its cards at the last minute, and a lot of haters insisted that the film would plummet in its second weekend of release, and I think hoped that Oppenheimer would become the dominant of the two films, even though it's not engineered to be the dominant of the two films. But anyway, a lot of us were nervous that that might indeed happen because the haters have been so successful before and because Barbie is so message heavy. And not just any message, feminism. So imagine our joy and relief that the film could not be slowed down. And in fact, is just doing so phenomenally well. I can't wait to outline it for you in today's movie math. And of course, to talk about Oppenheimer. Uh, you don't see anybody who likes Barbie rooting against Oppenheimer. I mean, some of us might not care for it, but we're not, we're not rooting against it. All right, so even though some of you like insist that we are. It's so bizarre. All right, so the two movies continue in fact to mirror each other, both sporting almost the exact same second weekend drop. Isn't that exciting? 43 and 44% respectively. Even Barbie has a little bit slightly better hold, so there's nothing for haters to grab onto. But I really do believe that they're both powering each other. They're creating just this perfect swirl, a perfect storm, where people just feel they need to go to the theaters to see both and just see some of them, maybe both of them multiple times. It's very exciting. I was at the movie theater myself again this weekend to see Oppenheimer with family on the IMAX. Uh, and it was so cool to be in such a crowded theater where there were just so many people showing up and everybody was excited. And in fact, AMC Lincoln Square has been doing so much business and they're a major movie theater, so they are always pretty busy but they sold out of regular size popcorn bags. That was really cool. I mean, really, you really haven't felt this energy. Even with some, there's been hits since Avengers Endgame, but you haven't felt this energy since then. Uh, can uh, Barbenheimer uh, repeat this dual action during award season? I think they can. And I think some of you will be surprised at how well Barbie can fare. I mean, never say never, we'll see. But I think Barbie's gonna be a real contender, especially as more and more films seem to be dropping away because of the strikes. So Hollywood has always long believed in counter-programming, but usually there's one blockbuster, while another movie is offered as more of an escape to those who have no interest in the main event film. You know, they're not really two uh, event movies. I mean, Oppenheimer's a little smaller, but it's still an event. Now, a lot of people have been pointing back to another Nolan uh, combo, by the way, but this, that time he was on top with 2008's The Dark Knight and Mamma Mia opening the same weekend. The Dark Knight, of course, became a billion dollar picture, while Mamma Mia, thanks largely to the overseas box office, got to 609.8. Don't worry, I think Oppenheimer's going to do a little better than that. But what's fascinating now, 15 years later, is that the male-oriented pick is the secondary film, where, while the female-oriented pick is the blockbuster. That is huge. Now, to be fair, Oppenheimer is about 40-60 when it comes to domestic versus overseas, so it's not as lopsided as Mamma Mia. And while Oppenheimer won't likely get to a billion dollars either, I think it'll get close, and I suspect do a little better, as I said, than Mamma Mia. I think at the rate that it's going, I would revise my prediction for its global total just a bit to anywhere between 650 and 800. I do believe it'll probably end up with a seven in front of it, but again, this is a special situation, so we're not quite sure exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, although it will lose its IMAX screens, uh, I think to Blue Beetle, so um, we'll see what kind of a dent that makes for the film. But it should be massive on digital. I suspect it'll do very well on digital. And I think by the time it hits Peacock, most people will have seen it by then because it will be so big on digital as well. But as impressive as Oppenheimer's box office is, especially for a three-hour, R-rated, very talky drama, Barbie is the behemoth. Wow. And it's sure, Barbie, I think, particularly boosted Oppenheimer as social media created this challenge where, as I said, everyone feels they need to see optimally both movies, even if under normal circumstances they wouldn't. Uh, and that's also interesting. I would suspect more of you who saw Barbie also checked out Oppenheimer because, you know, being good sports, while some people check that Oppenheimer is like a middle finger to Barbie for some reason.
It's worth noting that while Killian Murphy has been kind to Barbie, uh, saying, yeah, maybe he'd be a Ken. I mean, he said he had to see the script, but you're like, uh, is that, I mean, the script, you've seen the script, it's amazing. Uh, but Christopher Nolan has yet to acknowledge Barbie in a meaningful way. Uh, he doesn't have social media, to be fair, but surely Universal could tweet out a pic. Nolan did say in an interview that he was going to see Barbie, uh, even though he didn't participate in the ticket challenge with Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie that was started by Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie. Nolan, you're already fighting with Warner Brothers Discovery. You can't fight with everybody, and you're making a lot of money too. I think to keep this momentum going, I would strongly advise Christopher Nolan to get together with Greta Gerwig and take some kind of picture. I don't care if it's at the movie theater. I don't care if they're having lunch. I don't care if they're comparing notes. But it would just, I think, they need to keep this going. It's beneficial to both of them. And also, Nolan would get points for supporting a female filmmaker. You know, it's like, Nolan is such a famous director. Uh, why can't he just help out Greta Gerwig a little bit? Uh, especially because it would also help him. Uh, so yes, this time, Barbie is the Batman equivalent, with a second weekend so massive, it's the seventh biggest second weekend in movie history, not only up there with all male-driven superhero movies, but not one of them is an OG movie in their franchise. You know, like, there might be one that's the start of a section of a franchise, but none of them are the kickoff movie in a franchise, while Barbie is. And before you say Barbie is a well-known brand as a toy, so are all these other movies. They're all based on toys, comics, books. It's the same thing. So after just 10 days, Barbie is close to $800 million, and just after its second weekend. And it's already the third highest grossing film of the year. Not only does this guarantee that Barbie will be a billion dollar picture, but it now has a shot at surpassing Super Mario Brothers to become the biggest movie of the year. Right now, Barbie is pacing ahead of the last female-driven box office juggernaut, Disney's Beauty and the Beast, back when Disney was firing on all cylinders, which got to 1.2 billion only worldwide, which would be a real squeaker with Super Mario Brothers. So let's see, let's see what happens. Uh, I think that, you know, um, Barbie is really going to benefit from the fact that there's nothing in August and September standing in her way. So it's just going to be smooth sailing, quite frankly. And it's going to take a while for Barbie to hit digital because they're going to want to keep this box office theatrical train going. Although, as I said in a recent stream, I've already ordered Barbie on digital. I mean, it was right there. It was doing so well. I was like, I know I'm going to watch it again. Maybe we'll do a, a watch along. So Barbie, like Oppenheimer, has a better domestic to overseas balance. That's very good. When a movie's very strong domestic, that doesn't mean it's going to make less money overseas. Well, sometimes. Uh, movies like Little Mermaid, unfortunately, failed to do particularly well overseas. Same for uh, Spider-Verse. What about these two movies is the same? Hmm? Come on, overseas. Be cool. But anyway, that just means likely that these movies will make even more because they're doing so well domestic and overseas. Uh, but I think that Barbie is really doing well thanks to the party atmosphere, created not just by the vibe of the movie itself, but the incredible PR campaign run by the film and Warner Brothers Discovery. Not enough can be said about how incredible that PR campaign was and how vital it has been to the film's success. Other movies wish they got that kind of support from their studio. Margot Robbie and her co-stars had so much fun with their outfits, and that's a credit to Margot Robbie, by the way, who I believe hired a new stylist, thank God, um, to do that. I mean, that, Margot Robbie is a producer on Barbie. A lot of this is her idea, so she deserves credit as well. But, you know, for multiple premieres, great looks that were not only, I think, really big on social media, but encouraged audiences to have fun when they went to see the movie as well. So I would say it's not just the movies themselves that make a difference, but how they're marketed uh, with a clear theme. In this case, pink, right? And the great tagline, this Barbie is, and he's just Ken, as well as Kennergy, and I am Knuff. These were, these were things that allowed everyone to get in on the fun. You know, there isn't just one Ken and one Barbie. Everyone is Barbie and Ken, and that extends to the audience, which is brilliant. Warner Brothers Discovery even sent life-size Barbie boxes and step-and-repeat backgrounds to movie theaters so that audiences could photograph their looks and share them online, further driving online engagement and, of course, advertising the film. And then there's the things that the general public came up with themselves. Uh, Barbenheimer, right? And the hugely popular Tickets for Barbie meme, which started as soon as the movie campaign began, and I think people were surprised at how fun it was. 
Uh, everybody worked together to create a fun time at the movies. And it's electric, as I said, to be at the multiplex with such a large and enthusiastic crowd. Uh, I think that, you know, that gets people more excited. They want to come back, not just to see the movies, but to be part of that experience. Uh, they talk about it more to other people. Multiplexes now are in malls, so people are walking by and they see the crowd and they go, what's going on over there? It's just the energy feeds into itself. And again, I would say both movies are enjoying repeat viewing, but I would suspect, suspect that Barbie has a slight edge there, if not a considerable edge. Not to say that people aren't seeing Oppenheimer more than once, but Barbie has a shorter running time, a lighter tone, and more theaters. Uh, which are also selling out, but it's easier to get a ticket to Barbie if you plan a couple days in advance than it is to Oppenheimer, because it just doesn't have as many screens. Also, at a certain point, a movie is so big that even the most reluctant moviegoer, even some haters, feel, well, maybe I should check it out. Uh, this happened, for instance, with Avatar, the first Avatar. That's why it did so well, uh, which was also heavily themed, by the way, also with a color, in that case, blue. And there was also a big angle with the 3D that needs to be seen to be believed. Uh, James Cameron was shockingly able to repeat that success years later with Avatar 2, so that gives hope that maybe Greta Gerwig could, even if she takes a little bit of time, I don't think she'll take as long as James Cameron did, but to repeat the success of Barbie. And she should look to Avatar 2 as a template. And Barbie expands the type of movie that can be a blockbuster. It's not just action movies, you know, although Barbie does have a little action to it, which I think is integral. I said recently that Barbie was the first movie that haters could not tear down, but one of you had a great counterpoint. Uh, and that's that this Barbie is the first movie that's truly and unapologetically it's been able to deliver for its target audience. So while the haters still exist, the enthusiasm from the target audience is so great that it's not affected. This is an important lesson for Hollywood, which often has superficial good intentions, which they do not actually deliver on. So often Hollywood would say, you have a responsibility to support this movie. You have a responsibility to like this movie. And even and the target audience goes, yeah, but uh, it's not good, or it's not great, or I don't need to see it in theaters. Barbie, everyone's, everyone who that that would appeal to is like, oh my gosh, it's not only amazing, but it's better than I ever could have imagined, uh, which is great. And that credit goes again to Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig and Warner Brothers Discovery and Mattel for letting them go there. Uh, also, three cheers for original ideas, don't you think, right? These are all original ideas. Even Avengers Endgame was an original idea in its own way, as, is, as was No Way Home. Avengers Endgame was the first blockbuster that was the culmination of 10 years of storytelling, while No Way Home was the first franchise to bring back multiple actors from former installments for not just cameos, but large roles in the latest installment. That was huge, really, really big deal. And Sony, in terms of ad campaigns, don't forget how clever it was that they never acknowledged who they brought back, even though it had leaked and they just pretended it wasn't true and they had Andrew Garfield out there vehemently denying it, even though it was true, creating like this frenzy and everybody being worried that maybe it wasn't true indeed because why wouldn't they confirm it? It was brilliant. Uh, so can other movies join the party? Right now, it seems that everyone just wants to see Barbenheimer, right? While other movies struggle to get a piece of that action. More on that in a moment when we look at the rest of the top 10. Plus, while Barbenheimer looks set to play through Labor Day weekend, if not beyond, Audiences seem to have zero interest in most, if not all, of August's releases. Surely Warner Brothers Discovery could have had some fun with the Meg 2 ad campaign. I mean, it's about a giant shark goes after dinosaurs. Jason Statham is in it. I mean, this sounds like a recipe for fun. But I think they probably learned the lesson too late uh, with Barbie. Uh, and also they probably spent their entire advertising budget on Barbie with nothing left for the Meg 2. Aw, oh, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Maybe, maybe next for the, I hope, that, I hope this lesson is being learned. Uh, and also Ryan Reynolds is really good at advertising, right? That's kind of been his wheelhouse for a while. And so it's great to see other movies able to do the same thing. Uh, but all these August movies seem DOA and Hollywood is freaking out and assuming that it's because the talent can't promote the movies due to the strike. That's why they're starting to move films. But what I think it is, cause you know, nobody could actually promote Barbie or Oppenheimer in the last few weeks, right? I mean, these, these studios knew the strikes were coming. They could have filmed uh, material uh, in advance. You know, Barbie and Oppenheimer had to promote two weeks in advance before they even came out, basically. Um, although they did get that week extension from SAG, which SAG feels was, they, they, I thought they got the wool pulled over their eyes. That was a trick just to extend those ad campaigns. 
But I think that the real issue is that people are keen to see these movies, but just not in theaters. And I would add Haunted Mansion and Elemental to the list. I think all these films will do quite well on digital and streaming. Audiences just don't think they're theater worthy. Hollywood still doesn't quite understand what post-pandemic audiences feel is theater worthy. And I think it's becoming more of an experience-driven situation because you can get the same kind of cinematic quality at home now thanks to people's setups that they built up during the pandemic. So if you want to make people go to the theater, they have to feel like it's a party. You got to create that party atmosphere. And the fact that Oppenheimer is a party is impressive. And thanks to Barbie. You know, it's like, you know, it's the bachelor bachelorette party to a degree, even though there is crossover appeal. Uh, so what would you describe as the, what makes a difference between a theater worthy and untheater worthy film? I'd be curious to hear your own thoughts. Now, I think of the remaining movies this year, it doesn't look good. I think only Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon, both riding the Oppenheimer wave, seem like they're worth seeing in theaters. Uh, not Barbie level, but again, Oppenheimer level. I would have put Dune uh, Part 2 on the list, but it seems that audiences have turned on that franchise, finally willing to admit that they didn't care for the first film. I think ever because it came out kind of still during the pandemic, I think most people who saw Dune in theaters, maybe it made a difference to see it in theaters, but it seems everybody who watched Dune at home, uh, you know, on HBO Max Day and Date or down the line, hated it and just didn't feel like saying anything at the time because the audience scores for Dune are quite high, but now everybody hates it and has no interest in it. Uh, and then with Aquaman, while uh, we still have yet to see a trailer, and I did love the first one, and I do trust James Wan, I think not only is that, I mean, Rogue One got reshot to smithereens, and it turned out great. So here's hoping this is the same situation. But I think the DC brand is just really damaged right now, and I don't have any faith that it can rally, particularly with what seems like a leftover movie. Uh, two new movies did try to open this weekend, and it was brutal. Haunted Mansion opened lower than Jungle Cruise, and that movie opened day and date on Disney+. Plus. Whew! The RT score is not good for Haunted Mansion, and the audience scores are only okay. Interestingly, Haunted Mansion has opened on par with fellow Disney flick Elemental that had pretty good legs. I mean, it's still not doing great because it started so low. But, you know, it's held pretty good week to week. But I don't know if Haunted Mansion will follow suit as there are too many family picks set to open in August. I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Blue Beetle will surely wipe out Haunted Mansion in the weeks to come as they themselves likely struggle. Many are saying it was silly to open a Halloween movie in the middle of summer. And yes, it was dumb. And interestingly, the first Haunted Mansion movie inexplicably opened after Halloween for Thanksgiving. But that opened about the same as this Haunted Mansion, only that was 20 years ago. Now, the first Haunted Mansion had Eddie Murphy, who surely helped with the box office. He was in the heyday of his family film era back then. Although I think the, the first Haunted Mansion kind of killed it because he started to have his downturn right after it came out. But anyway, I got to say, I think a big problem with this Haunted Mansion is lack of star power. Because look, Haunted Mansion has a predominantly black cast, yet that was the lowest demographic that turned up. Most movies, most big movies with a largely black cast have a black audience demographic in the 30th percentile, the top or second to top demographic of the group. This is just shocking. Lakeith Stanfield might co-star on Atlanta, but perhaps he's better suited to strong supporting roles like fellow Atlanta co-star Brian Tyree Henry. He's great in Haunted Mansion, and he has a great leading man role, but his inability to bring in an audience is going to make it difficult for him to get more leading man roles going forward. And Owen Wilson and Jamie Lee Curtis ain't looking good either. They have smaller roles, but they were used significantly to promote the pick pre-strike, and they couldn't bring anybody in. The movie also did not do great with guys, 59% female. Maybe it should have been scarier, right? And a more ambitious cast. And wouldn't maybe more Jared Leto have helped, right? He's only in, uh, used sparingly in the film and was not used to, adver to advertise it at all. Uh, or is he still cursed these days, which some people suspect. Disney should be, you know, this is one area where the strike is helping Disney because now they have a little time to think about it before cameras roll on Tron 3. That was supposed to start filming in August. Uh, and I don't, I think Tron, I think uh, Jared Leto is a problem. Uh, and let's not forget, The Little Mermaid hit digital on Tuesday, which might have hurt Haunted Mansion as well, uh, as watching on digital is a cheaper and more convenient option. And Haunted Mansion will be on digital and Disney Plus down the line. It's not like people have to miss these movies. They just don't feel it's worth paying to see them in theaters. And another small horror film did sol uh, uh, so solid numbers. So not only does that continue the trend of horror doing solid business throughout this year and last, 
but uh, Talk to Me from A24 also had a, has, a, has a diverse cast uh, and is much scarier. Now, there's no demographic info on this film, unfortunately, but I wouldn't be surprised if it ate into Haunted Mansion's audience as well. As for the rest of the top 10, Sound of Freedom had another stellar hold and is now at close to 150 domestic, surpassing Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, which was just obliterated by Barbenheimer. Woo! Forget keeping its premium screens, Tom Cruise couldn't even hold on to regular large screens. Instead, pushed to the teeniest, tiniest screens at the multiplex. I like to check how many seats have been sold, and the, the size screens that Mission Impossible is on, and the number of seats in the theater, is just a joke. I mean, my goodness. Although, again, will the set sequel, Mission Impossible 8, fare any better? Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning ain't the only long-running franchise to falter this summer, so I don't know if it's entirely Barbenheimer's fault. I mean, Indiana Jones had a pretty good distance from Barbenheimer, and it's not doing good either. Over on streaming, starting with Nielsen for the end of June, Suits exploded, airing on both Netflix and Peacock, and almost tripled the viewing number minutes of runner-up The Witcher. Although this is where Nielsen's measurements get weird and kind of twist the, 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 the rankings. Suits ran for nine seasons and therefore dropped a whopping 136 episodes on streaming. And you can see other shows with multiple seasons and huge episode counts enjoy the same benefit on Nielsen charts because Nielsen lumps all the seasons together as one. But still, Suits is a great show, or was a great show, and this is a great, great number. Uh, for me, I started with Suits, which I loved, but then I graduated to Billions, and then I took my business masters with Succession. Oh, I hope you take the same journey. And by the way, once you move to the next show, you can't go back, so you know, make sure you're either done or ready to move on to the next uh, stage. Uh, but anyway, while this is obviously an out of left field and badly needed win for Meghan Markle, wouldn't it be great if Gabriel Mack was finally recognized for how awesome he is, right? In fact, there's a ton of great talent that was on Suits, uh, and they don't really work these days, so hopefully that will change that. Uh, this will change that. I mean, their agents can't make any calls because of the actor's strike, so I hope that they put a pin in this and say, they have got, these, these uh, actors have a whole lot of new fans thanks to how much Suits blew up on streaming. Uh, and The Bear, by the way, is still alive and thriving in week two of its binge release model. Hooray! It wasn't one and done either. Uh, over on the originals chart, Secret Invasion is not gaining any momentum with its second episode. And since a lot of you said you stopped watching after the second episode, let's see what happens to this show in the weeks ahead. I don't think it's going to be anything good. We'll see. Uh, with movies, speaking of succession, it's nice to see Shiv with her own movie on here, although once again these numbers are all pretty weak. Even Extraction 2 and Avatar 2, still on top, are running on fumes. They gotta get something to, I mean, then they're talking about delaying projects because of the strike, but you know, they're already, it's already rough out there. Uh, although that means there should be a distinct lack of competition for upcoming shows. Uh, so on Netflix's charts for just last week, The Outlaws is still number one for the third week in a row. Wow, that should help that cast too. And this movie is produced by Adam Sandler as part of his deal with Netflix. So everybody gets a, a, a nice round of applause yet again there. Uh, it has double the viewership of new movie they cloned Tyrone, uh, although Tyrone dropped on a Friday. So let's see what its numbers look like next week when it's played for a full week. And Nimona has fallen pretty far after a slight quick surge now almost out of the top 10. With shows, the new season of Sweet Magnolias debuted at number one, with audiences pretty evenly divided amongst The Lincoln Lawyer Season 2 and The Witcher Season 3. All solid, but no breakout hits. And you can see Suits has fallen pretty uh, low here after four weeks, right? So its supremacy on Nielsen might not be long lived, uh, unless everyone's still watching it over on Peacock. Over on iTunes, The Little Mermaid, which uh, is number one, which, as I said again, might have also heard Haunted Mansion. While The Flash is still in it, it didn't drop into oblivion after the first few days. That's encouraging, although still a tiny silver lining on a very, very dark cloud. Uh, plus, Joyride just hit digital, but only op opened in the middle of the top 10, meaning it hasn't really found an audience here either. As for this coming weekend, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles opens on Tuesday afternoon. Showtime start like at two o'clock. So it basically opens on Tuesday. It's so good. I hope people check it out. I'm nervous. I think it might tank. But anyway, uh, it has Dolby screens all to itself for about two days before it has to start splitting them with the Meg 2 
starting on Thursday afternoon. The Meg 2 is getting the evening show times, while Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles gets the afternoon. But what about the nostalgia play for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I would think as many adults are interested in that film as families, if not more. Oh, I'm really nervous about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. That could be real bad. Uh, Barbie should remain easily number one, while Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Meg 2, and Oppenheimer will all battle it out for the rest of the top four. It's going to be close, I think, amongst all three of those. Uh, on digital, You Hurt My Feelings comes out on Tuesday, wherever digital movies are uh, rented and sold. Uh, then with no digital movies really this week, on, you know, no, uh, no streaming movies this week. Uh, while with series on Wednesday, uh, the final season of Reservation Dogs starts on Hulu, as well as the final season of Physical on Apple TV. Thursday, Heartstopper returns with season two, as well as the second half of the Lincoln Lawyer season two, both on Netflix. Uh, Friday, Prime Video has The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart with Sigourney Weaver, uh, with season six of The Shy starting on Showtime. So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of the summer box office so far? Uh, and also, what's left of it? And, you know, you know, really, it's like before and after Barbenheimer, quite frankly. Although nothing seems to have changed. It's just all about Barbenheimer. All right, so share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.